Welcome back to Operating Systems. In today's lecture, we are going to take a closer look at what can happen if processes that run in parallel request resources. So the situation that can happen is what we call a deadlock. So we're visiting processes once more. We know that processes run concurrently in a common computer with a common operating system. And we've seen that in order to coordinate processes, we have to use synchronization primitives, such as mutexes or semaphores. And the basic idea to do this efficiently is to use passive weighting here. Passive weighting can be performed using semaphores, and semaphores then enable this functionality we need for synchronization. So they enable mutual exclusion of critical sections in our code. They can enable one-sided synchronization or also resource-oriented synchronization. And we've seen the use of semaphores for these three different use cases in our previous lecture. Now, the problem is that waiting mechanisms can lead to deadlock problems, and we have to do something about this. So what's a deadlock? Take a look at this example of a crossing of two roads here. And so we have four cars arriving simultaneously from all four directions. And the standard traffic rule is left yields to right. So no car is allowed to proceed in this situation. So that car here takes a look to its right, the driver, and sees, oh, there's another car. So that car has to wait. In turn, the next car here also looks to its right and sees, oh, yet another car. So this one also has to wait. The third one has another car to its right, so it also has to wait here. And of course, finally, the fourth car takes a look to its right and also has to wait. So we have a deadlock here. No car is allowed to proceed, even if in real life we would have certain rules to actually resolve such a conflict, uh, which would imply that the drivers of the cars actually communicate. And this can also lead to errors and accidents. Now, deadlocks like this can also occur when we use processes in our computer system. So why is this deadlock actually happening here? Take a look at a bit more simple example, just two cars coming from opposite sides here. One car tries to turn here into this road, which we indicated as left here because it's a left road from here. And the other car, of course, also tries to turn left. but from the view we have here, it's turning into the right road. So we indicate this here as R. So this situation is dangerous because a deadlock here is possible. And well, if this deadlock really occurs, this depends on the timing and order of events happening here. So if both cars actually proceed until the middle of that crossroad here, and then one car tries to turn this way and the other car tries to turn that way, then we have one car occupying L and needing R and the other car occupying R and needing L. So here no car can proceed without changing its direction, which is well not assumed in our cases here. So here we finally have a deadlock. If any of these cars would have come a second earlier or later, maybe this deadlock would not have happened. So let's take an abstract view of our problem. So we have two processes, C1 and C2, for our two cars. And these have different progress. So essentially, we are using resources L and R. And our car proceeds to use L and R for some time. And the other one also does this. Now, when we look at the intersection here, we have different orders that can occur. For example, we have a sequence that can occur here. So first that car proceeds here, and then we proceed up here. So we have sequence one. We don't have a deadlock. Or we can have this situation here. So our first car can come first and still no deadlock. But if we have a situation where we actually overlap here, then a deadlock is actually unavoidable. And on the other hand, we cannot actually enter the blue and green colored areas here because there's no way for our graph to overlap here. So a deadlock is unavoidable in this case of overlapping of resources here. 
Now if we change just a bit so that process C1 allocates the green resource just a bit later and there is no overlapping here, then we have all six possible sequences here and all six possible sequences actually lead to a successful completion. So in this scenario no deadlock can occur because we don't have an overlapping of our resources in our graph here. So no matter in which order our cars would take their way through the crossroad, actually they would find a successful sequence to complete their interactions. So what is this deadlock? So when we talk about deadlocks in computer science, this is defined as a situation in which two or more processes are unable to proceed because each of these processes is waiting for one of the others to do something. So because each of the processes is waiting for one of the others to do something, all processes are waiting at the same time. So none of these processes can proceed because all of them are actually blocked. This is the definition from one of our textbooks from Stallings actually. So what can actually happen when two processes run into a lock? So we summarize all of these under the term deadlocking, but in fact we have two different approaches to this or two different problems here. So the first alternative that can happen is a deadlock really. So a deadlock means we're passively waiting and the process states of the processes that are involved is blocked. Now there can also be an alternative happening here and this is alternative two, which we call a life lock. Life lock means we're actively waiting, so we're busy waiting, oh there's also forms of lazy busy waiting and this means our processes involved in our problem here can be in an arbitrary process state including the running state, but none of the involved processes is still able to proceed. Deadlocks are actually the lesser evil because we can discover this state uniquely which forms a basis to resolve deadlocks, whereas active waiting is usually only detected if we have something like an extremely high system load without anything happening on the machine, so the machine doesn't really proceed with the programs it should be running. So what are the conditions for deadlocks? To, for deadlock to occur we need three necessary conditions. All of these must be fulfilled for a deadlock to occur. So the first condition is we need an exclusive allocation of resources. So mutual exclusion, which means only one process may use a given resource at a time. So it allocates a resource and then it uses it and it releases it, releases the resource and while it is allocated, no other process may access this resource uh, that has been allocated to another process. The second condition is that allocation of additional resources can occur. So a process can first allocate one resource and as soon as it was allocated this resource it can decide it needs another resource and tries to allocate that too. This is what we call hold and wait. So a process may hold allocated resources while awaiting the assignment of other resources. And our third necessary condition is that there is no way for the operating system to remove any resource that's allocated from a running process. So we call this no preemption. And this means the operating system is unable to forcibly remove a resource from a process once it is allocated. Now if we have these three conditions, this doesn't mean that we necessarily have a deadlock in our system. So for a deadlock to occur, we actually need a fourth condition to take place. And this fourth additional condition takes place at runtime. And if this takes place, we really have a deadlock. And this condition is circular waiting. So we have a closed chain of processes, which uh, has the, uh, the condition that each process holds at least one resource needed by the next process in the chain. Before we give an example to this, let's talk about types of resources. So we know resources of our computer are administered by the operating system and the operating system then provides the resources to the processes. Now we have two different sorts of resources. One sort are reusable resources. These are allocated by processes for a certain time and after they have been used they are released by the process. 
Examples for this are the CPU or one of the CPUs, main memory and mass storage, I.O. devices, or even system data structures such as files or process table entries. And typically, to control and synchronize access to these reusable resources, we use mutual exclusion as we've seen in the previous lecture. The other sort of resources uh, is what we call consumable resources. So these are generated or produced and destroyed or consumed while the system is running. So uh, these may be events like interrupt requests or signals or messages or data coming in from input devices. And for these, we've also seen a typical method to implement access synchronization, which we called one-sided synchronization. So how can a deadlock occur when we have reusable resources? So for reusable resources, the deadlock occurs if we have two processes, each of them have allocated a reusable resource and there is additional uh, uh, other request of the respective other process for this same resource. So for example, we have a computer with 200 gigabytes of main memory. The number doesn't really matter here. And we have processes that don't allocate all of the memory they require in advance when starting the program, but they advance the memory they require in smaller steps. And the allocation of memory is blocking, so a process cannot proceed until it has actually been allocated this memory. So process one here starts by allocating 80 gigabytes, and then it computes something, and then it allocates an additional 60 gigabytes. So it doesn't release these 80 gigabytes here. And process two now starts allocating 70 gigabytes, it computes some stuff, and then it allocates another 80 gigabytes. So now we have this interaction with two processes that can occur. So first we can have process one allocating 80 gigabytes, then we have a process switch to process two. Process two allocates 70 gigabytes. So overall we have 150 gigabytes already allocated. Both processes can continue to run. The first process then tries to allocate 60 additional gigabytes. Remember, we had 150 already here, so plus 60 means we would try to allocate 210 gigabytes. That doesn't fit into our 200 gigabytes of main memory. So process one has to block here until memory is freed. Now, unfortunately, process two also needs additional memory. So after it allocated 70 gigabytes, it tries to allocate 80 gigabytes more. So we already had 150 allocated up here. So here we would need 230 gigabytes altogether. That doesn't fit. So process two also blocks. So process one waits for some memory to become free, but process two cannot free this memory because it itself waits for additional memory to become available. So if both process processes here execute their first resource request successfully before any of the second resource requests is executed, then a deadlock here is unavoidable. Now what happens when we have consumable resources? So for consumable resources, a deadlock occurs if we have two processes again, and each of these processes wait for a consumable resource, which is produced by the respective other process. So, for example, we could use synchronization signals exchanged between the two processes using semaphore operations, wait and signal, as we've seen before. So we have process 1 that declares semaphore S1, and process 2 declares semaphore S2, and process 1 first waits for process 2 to produce something here, but process 2 starts waiting for process one to produce something first. So since we start off with semaphore values of zero, nothing has been produced in the beginning, obviously, because our processes haven't run. So essentially process one blocks and waits here, whereas process two blocks and waits here. So none of the two processes can proceed here to consume and produce another element. So here each process waits for a synchronization signal from the other process, which cannot be sent, since the other process itself is currently in a blocked state. Now to obtain an overview of the 
relations between processes and resources, so the allocations and the requirements of resources, we use so-called resource allocation graphs. So a resource allocation graph consists of two kinds of nodes. So in yellow here we have our processes as circles here, whereas our green squares here are our resources. And processes and resources can be linked by using edges in our resource allocation graph and an edge can mean two things. So if we have a process and from this process an edge is outgoing to a resource, this means a process would like to use this resource. So P1 here in our example would like to use R1, so it requests R1, but it hasn't yet been allocated this resource. So it's currently waiting for R1 to become available here. If the arrow goes the other way around, so we have an edge from a resource to a process, this means we have a successful allocation. So at the current moment, our process P2 here is allocated our resource R2. So these resource allocation graphs, of course, they get more complex, describe a current system state. So they change over time when the system is running. The nodes of our graph are the processes and resources of our system and the edges show either an allocation or a request depending on the direction of the edges in our graph. So let's take a look at an example for modeling a situation using a resource allocation graph. So the questions we need to consider when looking at this resource allocation graph is actually derived from the force condition we've discussed before. So is there actually a state of circular weighting? And we use our resource allocation graph to figure this out. And then when we figured out that there is a state of circular weighting, we can look at that circle and find out which processes and which resources are part of the circle. So part of our problem here. So let's take a look at an example. We have seven processes we call just A to G and we have six resources. We give the names R to W subsequently. And we have a current state. So A allocates a resource R and wants to request an additional resource S. B currently has no allocation at all, but wants to request T. C allocates nothing at all, but requests S. D already has two resources allocated U and S and re requests an additional T. E allocates T and requests V. F allocates W and requests S. And G allocates V and requests U. So if we write it down like this, you see it's very difficult to find a circle. So our graphical representation here as our resource allocation graph makes this easier to see. So let's take a look. A allocates R and requests S. So our process A is here. It already has an allocation of R, so we have the edge going from the resource to the process, and it also requests S, so we have an edge going out from our process to resource S. B allocates nothing at the moment, so there's no ingo incoming edge to B, but it has a request on T. C allocates nothing but requests S, so C is here, we have a request to S again. D has two allocations for U and S. So here we have D, which already holds U and S. And D also wants to have T in addition. And then we have E that has T at the moment and wants to have V. We have F that allocates W and wants an S again. And we have G finally that holds V at the moment and requests you. So now what you have to do, and this is indicated in red here, is to find a circle in the graph. So here on the left hand side there is no problem, we have no circle, but then here we find a circle. So we know we have edges always going from yeah, processes to resources or the other way around, and if we find a circle that always goes in the same direction here, we know D holds U and is waiting for T. So this means D cannot proceed because T is currently held by E. E again holds T and requests V. Now V is currently held by G, but G also cannot proceed because G itself is waiting for U, which is held by D. So we have this circle here between the processes D, E and G, which means these three processes actually cannot proceed. In addition, they might hinder other processes from proceeding because B requesting T or S requesting D 
can also not proceed in this situation. Now, to model this problem in a bit more, well, realistic way, more or less, uh, in computer science we use a classic example, and this classic example is called the dining philosopher's problem. So assume you have a household where five philosophers live, and as you might know, philosophers just do two things in life. So either they are thinking or they are eating. And if they are eating, they love to eat spaghetti. So, of course, because it's a common household, our philosophers sit around a round table. So each philosopher has his or her own place around the table here. So we just numerated the philosophers from 0 to 4 here. And because thinking makes you hungry, every philosopher has to eat from time to time. Now to eat, if you've eaten spaghetti before, you know this is very messy if you try it with a fork and a knife. So of course you do it in a traditional way and use two forks to eat spaghetti. Now unfortunately, as philosophers don't really earn money because all they do is think and eat, they have to uh, live with very few cutlery. So these poor philosophers only own five plates and five forks. So. To eat spaghetti, a philosopher now needs both forks next to her or his plate. So uh, we have a scarcity of forks if all philosophers want to eat at the same time. So what we're doing here in this, yeah, admittedly a bit artificial example, is we model processes by philosophers. So the philosophers do something, they think or eat, so they change state. And the resources they're requesting are the forks. And a fork is indivisible, so a fork cannot be used by two philosophers at the same time. So let's take a look if there's a problem with deadlocked philosophers. So to figure out if there's a deadlock problem, we need to figure out if our three first necessary conditions are actually fulfilled. So our first condition was mutual exclusion. And we've seen philosophers need both forks before they can begin to eat spaghetti. The second condition is hold and wait. So, of course, this again is a bit of an artificial condition. And we just assume that our philosophers are so deep in thought before they eat that they're unable to take both forks at the same time. And they don't get the idea to put back a single fork when they can't get the other one. So this is hold and wait. We've requested one fork. And the next thing we can only think about is to get the other fork because we're so hungry for spaghetti. And the third condition is no preemption. So, of course, it's absolutely inappropriate to take another philosopher's fork by force while the other philosopher is eating spaghetti. That's no good style. Now the question is, does this necessarily lead to a deadlock? So let's take a look at a possible implementation of our dining philosopher's problem. So we have a function modeling a philosopher, or actually we have five functions modeling all of our five philosophers. So this they execute the same code because the philosophers just do the same things. So a philosopher uh, gets past its number, so our philosopher knows who he is. And a philosopher then continuously in an endless loop does some thinking, then it gets hungry, so it grabs some forks and it passes its own number to the grab function. Then our philosopher eats. And when our philosopher is no longer hungry, our philosopher drops the forks again. Of course, we don't need to show you what think and eat does. So what's interesting is what do our functions grab and drop do? So our functions grab and drop are implemented here on the right hand side. So uh, first, we have a semaphore array fork for our number of philosophers. And this is uh, initialized by 1 and null. And the grab function now, depending on the number of our philosopher, then takes the one fork, which is to the right hand side of the philosopher. This is just indicated as fork of our number who. So it waits for it using the wait operation on our semaphore here. And then afterwards, it waits for the other fork here. So who plus one, so the fork on the left hand side. Because we have a circular table, of course, we have only fork numbers going from zero to four. So whenever philosopher number four tries to get his left fork, 
Then, of course, we have to start at zero again because it tries to get for from four and number zero. So that's why we take the modulo operation. So we take the modulo of uh, the division by uh, the number of philosophers we have in our problem here. So this problem can scale to more philosophers, obviously. So essentially what can happen is that a philosopher who is hungry grabs the forks. It will first waits for his right fork and then the philosopher waits for the left fork. But of course each of these wait operations can block. And now when forks are dropped we first drop the right fork and afterwards we drop the left fork. So by using these semaphores here and the wait operations we guarantee mutual exclusion when accessing the forks. And we have a tradition here, which philosophers use since thousands of years, obviously. And this tradition is that each and every philosopher first takes the right fork and then takes the left fork afterwards. So let's take a look at a possible sequence of operations. So first our philosopher zero comes, is hungry and grabs the right fork. Now then our philosopher number one appears. So in terms of our processes, we do a process switch after the wait here. And philosopher one is also hungry and grabs its own right fork. Another process switch occurs. Philosopher two grabs the right fork. Another process switch, philosopher three grabs the right fork. And finally, philosopher four comes, comes along, grabs the right fork. There is no process switch in this case and it immediately now tries to grab the left fork, which is fork zero. Now, unfortunately, fork zero is already blocked. So because this is blocked, our operating system then switches processes again. So it switches back to this here. So pro philosopher three waits for fork number four. Fork number four, as we've seen, was already blocked here. So we switch again. Philosopher two waits for fork number three, which was just blocked here and so on and so forth until we finally arrive at the situation that also philosopher zero tries to grab the left fork, so fork number one, which unfortunately is already held by philosopher number one. So what happens here is that all of our five philosophers sit at the table before a nice full tasty plate of spaghetti and each of these philosophers hold one fork in their right hand and anxiously wait for the left fork to be available which never occurs, so they'll probably starve and die. That's a sad story, isn't it? So if we take a look at our resource allocation graph, we see we have philosopher zero. Philosopher zero already has fork zero and waits for fork one. Philosopher one has fork one, waits for fork two. Philosopher two has fork two, waits for fork three, and so on until we finally arrive at philosopher four. And this closes our circle here because that one waits for fork zero, but that was held by philosopher zero in the beginning. So this is our resource allocation graph for the dining philosopher example. And this means we have a full circle here. So all of our edges go in the same direction here and they always interconnect a process and a resource and a process again. So this means we have our false condition fulfilled now. So we're circular waiting. So none of our processes can proceed. None of our philosophers can eat in this situation. Well, of course, we can't let our philosophers starve. So we have to write a better philosopher. So let's see if we can uh, yeah, probably solve this problem by adding additional synchronization. And this synchronization now ensures that when uh, one of the forks is taken, that the other can also be taken in the same critical section. So the problem in the previous version one was that the consequence of a process switch between the first and the second weight resulted in a critical section being interrupted. So taking the left fork and the second, uh, the second, the right fork, no, the right fork first and then the left fork together is a critical section. So we see by adding an additional mutex here with which we protect the allocation of our both forks here, this protects the critical section using mutual exclusion. So the problem is, is this solution actually deadlock free? So can philosophers eat? But the second question we have to ask ourselves if this is actually a good solution. Now let's see. The solution is deadlock free. 
because we added our mutex around our critical section here. So one process at max can wait for a fork and a cycle of processes of course needs at least two processes obviously. And a process that's waiting for this mutex, which is shared among all the philosophers, has no fork. So we have at least one philosopher that can actually get two forks, start eating, drop the forks again, and so on. So is this a good solution? Uh, no, definitely not. So when the philosopher with our number who eats, we know our philosopher number who plus one blocks in the critical section which means all the other philosophers then also block. So only one philosopher gets to eat uh, at the same time, so many spaghetti get cold and go to waste. So what we have here in terms of an operating system and a CPU is that we only provide a low level of concurrency, which means we have a very inefficient use of resources in our system. So let's take a look at yet another version of an implementation for our dining philosophers. So here we first introduce a number of helper variables and functions. So we declare a constant variable n indicating the number of philosophers. Again, we have our mutex here for protecting our critical section initialized to one. And we have a sum of our s. So one for each of our philosophers here, all initialized to zero here. Now uh, to indicate the state a philosopher is currently in, we add an enum, so an enumeration of symbolic numbers here. So a philosopher can now be in one of three states. So we've seen a philosopher can be thinking, a philosopher can be eating, and now we add an additional state to a philosopher, which means that a philosopher can also be hungry. So uh, this means we indicate something that is an additional state here, which means we can use this additional state to maybe introduce more concurrency. Now we add two helper functions here, left of i and right of i, and this just uses the modulo function to indicate the left and the right neighbor respectively of the current philosopher that is executing the code. So a philosopher has two functions as we've seen, a grab function and a drop function here. So in its grab function here, it waits first for the mutex to enter the critical section, then, then it sets its own state to a hungry state now, and it executes test of i. So test of i now checks if our state, our own state is hungry. Well, yes, we have just set it to hungry. And only if our left neighbor isn't eating and our right neighbor is also not eating, then we can start to eat because that means both forks are free. And then we can signal our own semaphore here. So we can continue after we returned from our test function and exited our critical section. Now, if we want to drop our forks because we have finished eating, so we're just full of spaghetti, then we execute this drop function here. And this drop function again waits for our mutex to enter the critical section. So we are no longer eating, so our own state is thinking now. And now we run our test function for our left and our right neighbor. So we try to help our left and our right neighbor by telling them, okay, my fox has just become free. So if we have two forks, I'll feel free to start eating. So for my left and right neighbor in that order, we do the same. So we check if the left uh, neighbor is hungry and well, myself isn't eating and maybe it's other neighbor on the other side is also not eating. Then my left neighbor can start eating and is signaled or we can do this the same for our right side neighbor. Again, if that right side neighbor is hungry and one of these is already fulfilled because I'm no longer eating and the other side also no longer has to eat, then that other neighbor on my right side can also start to eat again. So it's signaled and it can continue. So this solution here is deadlock free. And you can also show that this has the maximum degree of concurrency for our dining philosopher problem. But as you see from the implementation, and as we've seen with semaphores before, a correct solution that's also efficient takes quite a bit of effort to implement. So we have to add, uh, uh, add this mutex here to predict critical sections. We have to add this separate state. And we have to add this logic by actually checking for our neighbors if they're hungry, telling them, OK, your fork is available now, at least on my side. So go ahead. Maybe you can eat now. Anyways, that's a good solution. But it also shows that you have to be really careful when implementing semaphore-based solutions.
So what we've seen in our example here, that there are different ways to achieve a deadlock-free system. So to ensure that a system is deadlock-free, and these solutions can differ in the possible degree of concurrency they allow. And we've also seen that a resolution that is maybe simple but too restrictive implies that some resources are unnecessarily idle, at least a part of the time, so some of our spaghetti get cold. In general, the dining philosophers are an interesting representative example for administering atomic resources. These have been invented by Dijkstra already in the 1960s, and this is one of the standard scenarios that you can use to evaluate and also demonstrate operating system and also language mechanisms that are used for concurrent programming. So how can we prevent deadlocks in general? So essentially there are two approaches to prevent deadlocks. The first are indirect methods. Indirect methods try to invalidate one of the necessary conditions one to three we've seen. So either use non-blocking approaches for allocating resources or only allow atomic resource allocation. So if we need resource one, two, and three, we have to, re uh, have to allocate or request them all at once. Or we have to enable the preemption of resources using virtualization. This can be virtual memory, virtual devices, or virtual processors. There are also direct methods. And direct methods actually try to attack condition four, which also has to occur in order to have a deadlock here. And this can be done by introducing a linear or total order of resource classes. So this means that we can only allocate resources in a certain order. So a resource R index I can only be successfully allocated before another resource R index J if I is ordered linear before J. So this just means I is lesser than J. So we have to allocate the resources we need in a given order, which means if every process does this, there is no problem with uh, any circular waiting condition here. We can also have rules to prevent deadlocks. These include methods at design and implementation time. So uh, we can prevent circular waiting in a running system using strategic approaches. So these strategic approaches mean that none of the first three necessary conditions have to be invalidated. So we don't need to change any of our software to do resource allocation in an atomic way or in a certain order. And we need to do continuous requirements analysis. So we need to continuously check whenever there's a new resource allocation. Would this new resource allocation actually lead to a situation where a circular resource graph would be established? So what we need to do is we need to control the resource requests of our processes and we need to ensure to always keep a safe state. And a safe state means that there is no process sequence in which all of the processes can obtain their maximum resource requirements. And we avoid unsafe states. So we have to uh, deny requests in case of a resource requirement we are unable to satisfy. So requesting processes that try to actually allocate a resource that cannot be satisfied right now are not currently serviced or are suspended early. Now this approach looks nice in theory, but it has a problem. And this problem is that the approach has to know the maximum resource requirements of a process in advance. And especially if you're handling dynamic data, stuff coming in over the network, whatever, this is very difficult or even impossible to figure out. So let's now take a look at safe and unsafe states, first using our example of dining philosophers. So at our starting point, all of our five forks are available, and we know each philosopher needs a left and a right, so two forks to eat. So we can have a situation where three philosophers 0, 1, and 2 have one fork each. So three forks are used, so two remaining forks are free here. So what can happen now is that P3 also comes to the table and requests a fork. So we have four forks allocated, one fork is still free. This is a safe state because one of the three philosophers at least could now eat. And then we can allocate the request of our philosopher three, so it's accepted. Then P4 tries to request a fork. Now no more forks are free. And now we have an unsafe state so none of the philosophers could eat in this situation. So 
What happens here if P4 tries to request a fork, then P4 has to wait for his fork to become free in addition to another fork. So if four philosophers have one fork each, then we know the fifth philosopher has to be blocked before taking the first fork, because otherwise we can end up in this situation where each of our philosopher has his right fork and cannot get to the left fork. So what we actually do here is we have a resource allocation graph like this. This looks very much like the one before, but notice that this edge here now goes the other way around. So philosopher four wants two forks. And if we change this request edge here, so philosopher four would actually get fork number four, then we'd have a closed circle here in our research al resource allocation graph, which would lead to a deadlock. So we need to detect a situation like this and then try to hinder philosopher four from doing the allocation of fork four, for example. So in general, we can also look at safe, unsafe states uh, when we consider multiple instances of resources. So here our starting point is a assumed primitive Unix system, which has a maximum of only 12 shared memory segments. And now we know the maximum allocations of our processes. So process P0, we know it needs maximum of 10 segments, P1 needs four, and P2 needs nine segments. Now the current situation might be that P0 currently uses six segments, and P1 and P2 each use two segments. So we have 10 segments allocated out of our 12 segments, which means two segments are free. So now P2 requests another segment, so one remains free. Now here we'll end up in an unsafe state. So we have to deny the request of P2, so P2 has to wait. If in turn P0 requests two additional segments, none of the segments would be free, so we'd also end up in an unsafe state, so we'd also have to deny the request of P0, so P0 has to wait. What we can do here is we can find a safe process sequence. So if we execute P1 first, afterwards we execute P0, and finally we execute P2, then we can fulfill the resource requirements of all of our processes here. And the detection of the fulfillment of our resource requests is called the banker's algorithm. So the banker's algorithm administers our resource graph, we can also express this as a matrix, as a process resource matrix for the current and maximum allocation. And the banker's algorithm provides a function to find a process sequence that guarantees that our system does not run out of resources, even in the case when all processes completely use their, well, the banker would call it credit limit. So how many resources they're actually able to allocate up to the maximum they indicated. And if we can apply this function predictively uh, for resource allocation, then we can actually detect if our system would be able to enter an unsafe state. This state cannot be allowed, so we can derive a safe process sequence from this. So how does deadlock detection work in practice in an operating system? Now, very many operating systems actually use a very simple approach to detect deadlocks. And this is the approach that if a deadlock occurs, it's just silently accepted. This is also calling the ostrich algorithm. So we just stick our head in the sand and just assume oh, we don't see any problem here. So we're ignoring it. So in very many systems, actually nothing in the system tries to avoid the occurrence of waiting cycles. And the operating system doesn't try to invalidate any of our four conditions for deadlocks here. Well, that's an easy solution, and that's amazingly the solution most operating systems take, just because deadlocks occur very rarely, and it's very, very uh, much work to actually implement a deadlock detection. Now, if we nevertheless want to implement deadlock detection, what we can do is we can create a resource allocation graph or waiting graph and search for cycles. So this means whenever we have a resource allocation or deallocation, we have an overhead of O of N, which with n is the number of uh, resources actually that we have to go through uh, to indicate and guarantee that we're cycle free. So if we 
do this too frequently, we waste resources and compute time. If we do this too unfrequently, we might end up wasting resources, which can be unused for quite some time. And uh, the cycle search takes place in large intervals only. If we figure out that resource requests take too much time, so we need some sort of analysis to figure out how much time does it take from a research re resource request to resource allocation, or if we figure out that the CPU load actually goes down, even though the number of processes goes up, or we figure out that our CPU is already idle for a long time, but we have a lot of processes running in our system, which should be able to do something. So to uh, resolve a deadlock after we detected it, we can enter a recovery phase after detection. So what can we do? Now, essentially we have to break the circle in our resource allocation graph. So one thing we can do is we can terminate processes. So terminating a process means the process is forced to release the resources it holds. So what we can do is we can start at one point in the circle and terminate the deadlock processes step by step. This is a lot of effort depending on how large your circle is. And the idea would be to start with the most effective victim whatever that may be. So essentially the process, if we terminate it, that is most probable to free a large number of uh, affected resources. Or we can uh, do the more brutal approach and simply terminate all of our deadlock processes. Now this, of course, can cause more data loss, more uh, loss of compute time. So the damage we can imply during uh, all, a termination of all the deadlock processes can be pretty large. We can try to preempt resources, again start with the most effective victim. So this needs additional functionality inside of our operating system. This means we need to actually force our program process that uh, is deadlocked to go back in time. And there's mechanisms to do this, they are called rollback or so we take regular snapshots of our process state and we take one of the last snapshots where our process hasn't been deadlocked. and well, start this process again from there, or we can just completely restart the affected process depending on obviously the semantics of your process. So this uses either transactions or checkpoint and recovery. Again, not every operating system supports this and this takes lots of effort. Again, we also have to avoid a starvation of the rollback process. So we're a situation where we roll back the process again and again and again because it never gets the resource and it just tries to actively uh, acquire this resource again and is rolled back all the time. So we also have to take care of life locks here. And if we want to do deadlock resolution, we have to find a good balance between damage and effort. So damages are unavoidable because we have a deadlock. So we, to resolve this, we have to get rid of at least one process. So its results, its data may be lost. So we actually need to consider the consequences of what we're actually going to do when we're resolving a deadlock. So let's discuss prevention methods. Because methods to avoid and detect deadlocks have a little practical relevance in the contents of operating systems. We've seen they're very difficult to implement. They require a large overhead and in a real life system, actually they're not usable. And so in most operating systems, they're actually not used. And we use the Austric algorithm. And this works pretty well since most of our programs we use are still pretty much sequentially programmed. So uh, this is a predominant approach. We have a low level of parallelism and of synchronization requirements. So maybe we rarely need avoidance and detection methods. So uh, if we try to prevent deadlocks another way, we could try using virtualizing resources. So virtualizing resources means we don't have any deadlocks anymore because like with virtual memory, we've added an additional layer that can remap one resource to another resource here. So if one dedicated physical resource would be allocated, then we would try to just uh, use a different resource without the process actually noticing. So using virtualization, actually physical resources can be removed or preempted from a process uh, without the process noticing in critical moments. Processes can only request and allocate logical resources now, and these, as we've seen, can be remapped on the fly. Accordingly, we invalidate the non-preemption condition uh, 
so one of our necessary three conditions and we have avoided deadlocks here. So uh, what we can learn from this is that prevention methods are more commonly used and more relevant in practice in operating systems. So let's conclude our lecture for today. So we've seen we have problems with deadlocks and live locks and we've seen this is defined as a situation in which two or more processes are unable to proceed because each of these processes is waiting for one of the others to do something. And we've also seen live locks are actually the bigger problem of the two because they actively waste compute time without producing any useful results. And we've also seen for a dead and live lock to occur, we need these four conditions that have to occur simultaneously. So we need exclusive allocation, we need hold and wait and no preemption as necessary conditions. And if we in addition have circular waiting of the processes requesting a subset of the resources, then we have a deadlock here. And to handle deadlocks or live locks, we can try to prevent them, avoid them or detect and resolve the deadlocks and uh, the discussed approaches can also be combined. So that's all about deadlocks uh, and that's our lecture for today. Thanks for listening and until next time.